Okay, today is the 6th of September and we are on the 55th chapter Suttapati Sangyutta. Welcome to Sutta 55.21. It's on page 1808. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans at Kapilavatu in the Grodas Park. Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Rebel Sir, this Kapilavatu is rich and prosperous, populous, crowded, with congested thoroughfares. In the evening when I am entering Kapilavatu after visiting the Blessed One, all the monks worthy of esteem, I come across a stray elephant, a stray horse, a stray chariot, a stray cart, a stray man. On that occasion, Rebel Sir, my mindfulness re- regarding the Blessed One becomes muddled. My mindfulness regarding the Dhamma becomes muddled. My mindfulness or recollection regarding the Sangha becomes muddled. The thought then occurs to me, if at this moment I should die, what would be my destination? What would be my future born? Stop here for a moment. So here this Mahanama. Mahanama is a relative of the Buddha. And uh, this Kapilavatu uh, is, uh, is a place where all the Sakyans uh, Live, uh, so he says uh, in the evening after he has gone to visit uh, the Buddha or the monks uh, in the, uh, during the Buddha's time uh, the, the, the monks, the monasteries were almost all forest monasteries uh, out of the city uh, so after visiting the Buddha or the other monks uh, he comes back into the city uh, and then when he goes into the city sometimes he meets uh, Stray elephants, stray horse, stray chariot, stray cart, stray man. These, uh, I mean, these uh, stray elephant and all that are those that are out of control sometimes. Or the stray chariot, uh, stray cart, uh, running very fast, uh, out of control. So at that time, uh, he's very excited uh, because it might knock him and kill him. Uh. So he says at that time, uh, his recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha is not there. Lah. And if he should die suddenly, eh, where would he be reborn? Mm-hmm. This, this sutta is quite important because uh, nowadays a lot of people talk about the last thought moment that comes from Abhidhamma. They say eh, at the moment when you are dying, if you can think of a good thought, eh, it will bring you to a good rebirth. Eh. Uh, or if at that moment eh, you... Uh, excited, you, uh, you're not thinking of a good thought, then you don't go off to a good rebirth. Nah? So let's see what the Buddha says. Eh? The Buddha said, don't be afraid, Mahanama. Don't be afraid, Mahanama. Your death will not be a bad one. Your demise will not be a bad one. If a person's mind has been fortified over a long time by faith, virtue, and his moral conduct, learning, generosity and wisdom, Right here, crows, vultures, hawks, dogs, jackals or various creatures eat his body consisting of form, consist, composed of the four great elements, or, originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to breaking apart and dispersal. But his mind, which has been fortified over a long time by faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom, that goes upwards, goes to distinction. Suppose Mahanama, a man submerges a pot of ghee or a pot of oil in a deep pool of water and breaks it. All of its shards and fragments would sink downwards, but the ghee or oil there would rise upwards. So too Mahanama, when a person's mind has been fortified over a long time by faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom. Right here, crows, etc. may eat his body, but his mind which has been fortified over a long time by faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom. That goes upwards, goes to distinction. Don't be afraid, Mahanama. Don't be afraid, Mahanama. Your death will not be a bad one. 
your demise will not be a bad one. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, even though you may be attacked by various creatures uh, and eaten, uh, and even though you may feel fear that at the last moment, but because you have practiced these few things, uh, you have faith in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, you have moral conduct. Moral conduct normally refers to Aryan normal conduct. Uh, and basically it's the seven precepts, uh, the three the three body precepts and four verbal precepts. Uh. Learning here refers to much learning, Bahu Satcha or sometimes Bahu Sutta. This term uh, in Chinese is called Tuo Wen uh, and it refers to much learning of the Buddha's Dhamma, much understanding of the Buddha's Dhamma. Bahu Satcha means much truths, uh, Satcha means truths. So that means much knowledge of the the truths, uh, the Buddhist truths. Uh. Bahu Sutta means much hearing, much hearing of the Dhamma, the Buddha's Dhamma. Uh, here, so here it just says learning, uh, but it refers to these two words. Uh having much knowledge of the Buddha's uh, discourses, uh, the Buddha's words. Uh. Generosity, uh, born of giving to others, helping others, and wisdom. Because of these five qualities, uh, the Buddha says, uh, the mind will bring you up. Uh, doesn't matter how your body dies, uh, because your mind is an elevated mind. Mm. So generally, I like to say uh, that uh, when a person dies, uh, even though he may be certified dead uh, by the doctor, that is only clinical death. Uh. That is not death. No, it's, it's not actual death uh, in the Buddha's teachings. Uh. In the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha says, uh, when a person dies, uh, three things stop. I think in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta. What are these three things? One is vitality. Uh, vitality. Vital energy. Second one is consciousness. Third one is body heat. Now, when a person really dies, these three things leave him. So, when these three things leave him, then you will only know by when you touch the body. When you touch the body, the body is cold, and he definitely will not revive. But if a if a corpse, the body is still warm. There's still a possibility that that being uh, is, is, is alive uh, and may revive. Uh, uh. So normally when a person dies, uh, the six senses uh, will shut off one by one. Uh, and the last to shut off uh, is a consciousness. And the doctor says that the person is dead, uh, only usually only because of two things, uh, because the breath has stopped and the heart has stopped. Uh, and what happens is usually when he's pronounced dead by the doctor, uh, usually uh, he's still alive. Uh, the mind is still going uh, and the body is still warm, uh, maybe for another one or two hours or three hours or sometimes even more. Uh. That period uh, between that clinical death uh, and the actual death, uh, the mind is like dreaming. Uh, the mind is thinking, thinking. And those thoughts uh, cannot be controlled by anyone. Uh, and those thoughts depend on his karma, his karma. If that person uh, is like the Buddha says, uh, has faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom, uh, he always thinks of uh, good things, uh, things of wholesome, wholesome things, uh, things of elevated things, uh, not low things. Uh. He doesn't have uh, thoughts of greed, hatred and delusion. If he has uh, good thoughts, uh, wholesome thoughts, uh, that, uh, at that at that at that moment when he's dying, uh, he's thinking of all these thoughts, uh, so he'll go to, to a good rebirth. Uh. This uh, teaching uh, that you have to control your last thought uh, is not valid, uh, because you just cannot control your last thought, uh, it depends on your karma. Uh. So like, for example, uh, a few years ago, one of our devotees in Penang, he told me that the mother died of cancer. When the mother died, she was in pain because of the cancer. 
So when she was certified dead by the doctor, uh, the face uh, showed uh, a lot of pain. But one hour later, the daughter told me uh, that uh, the mother's face uh, changed entirely. Uh. She was uh, smiling and looked very happy and peaceful uh, and uh, entirely different. Uh, so you can see uh, that person uh, must have been a very good person. Uh, so if your heart, your mind is good, uh, those last thoughts are good thoughts uh, and will bring you, because of your happy state of mind, uh, bring you to a happy rebirth. Uh, uh. So what I always like to say is that our everyday mind is very important. That is our natural frequency. So if our everyday mind, we always think of good things, wholesome things, we always have wholesome states of mind. So when we die, we will naturally go to our natural frequency. Our last thoughts will be your everyday thoughts, like what you generally think of every day. So that's why it's uh, everyday thoughts. Huh? If you want to have a good rebirth, you want to have a wholesome uh, st states of mind every day, huh? that needs a lot of training, huh? that needs a lot of uh, practice, cultivation of the mind. Huh? So it takes years. Huh? So I always say it takes years to prepare for death. Sometimes some people, uh, they never learn the Dhamma, they're not interested in the Dhamma, full of greed, hatred and delusion. And when they are dying, uh, they come and tell us how to help their mother, how to help their father. Cannot help because the, the, the habit, uh, habitual tendency uh, is already fixed. And the last moment, uh, you cannot change that. It takes many years to change. Uh. So people don't understand. Uh, so sometimes worldly people, uh, they see us are uh, interested in the spiritual path and uh, they think we are very foolish, uh, wasting our time, not enjoying all the worldly pleasures. Uh. Recently we have one of our devotees, uh, the sister-in-law has never been interested in religion. Uh. Now she's dying of cancer. Now she cannot talk, uh. but a few months ago when she could talk, uh, she told our devotee uh, that she, she has one big regret in life, uh, that she was never interested in religion. Uh. Because of no, no, no interest in religion uh, now that she is dying, uh, she is totally unprepared. Uh. Mm -hmm. This sutta tells us uh, that our everyday mind is very important. Uh. Go to the next sutta, another very important sutta called the Sarakani Sutta 55.24. At Kapilavatu again. Now on that occasion, Sarakani the Sakyan had died, and the Blessed One had declared him to be a stream enterer, Sotapanna, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny, with enlightenment as his destination. Thereupon, a number of Sakyans, having met and assembled, deplored this, grumbled and complained about it, saying, It is wonderful indeed, sir. It is amazing indeed, sir. Now who here won't be a stream enterer when the Blessed One has declared Sarakani the Sakyan after he died to be a stream enterer with enlightenment as his destination? Sarakani the Sakyan was too weak for the training. He drank intoxicating drink. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So this uh, Sarakani the Sakyan, nah, he had been a drinker. Nah. Drink, drink, he drinks uh, liquor. La. After he died, the Buddha said uh, that he was a Sotapanna, called for a good rebirth. And a lot of these Sakyans, uh, they found it too difficult to believe. La. They thought uh, the Buddha always talked about the five precepts. Everybody, uh, all lay people must keep the five precepts. And one of these five precepts uh, is to refrain from taking intoxicants, uh, including liquor. La. Mm. So they thought uh, that he cannot even keep the five precepts. How can he go to heaven? Uh? How can he be an Arya? Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and reported this matter to him. The Blessed One said, Mahanama, when a lay follower has gone for refuge over a long time to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, how could he go to the nether world? For if one speaking rightly were to say of anyone, he was a lay follower who had gone for refuge 
over a long time to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. It is of Sarakani, the Sakyan, that one could rightly say this. Mahanama, Sarakani, the Sakyan, had gone for refuge over a long time to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. So how could he go to the netherworld? Here, Mahanama, some person possesses firm confidence in the Buddha. That means unshakable faith in the Buddha. And in the Dhamma in the, and the Sangha. He is one of joyous wisdom, of swift wisdom, and he has attained liberation. By the destruction of the Asavas in this very life, he enters and dwells in the taintless liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, realizing it for himself with direct knowledge. This person, Mahanama, is free from hell, the animal realm, and the domain of ghosts, free from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld. The Buddha mentions the netherworld, uh, he refers to the three woeful planes of rebirth, uh, the ghost realm, the animal, and the hell realm. Here, Mahanama, some person possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. He is one of joyous wisdom, of swift wisdom, yet he has not attained liberation. With the utter destruction of the five lower factors, he becomes one of spontaneous birth, due to attain Nibbana there, without returning from that world. This person too, Mahanama, is freed from hell, the animal realm and the domain of ghosts, freed from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the nether world. And this second type of Arya is the Anagamin. Here Mahanama, some person possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. He is not one of joyous wisdom, nor of swift wisdom, and he has not attained liberation. The utter destruction of three fetters, and with the diminishing of greed, hatred and delusion, he is a once returner, who, after coming back to this world only one more time, will make an end to suffering. This person too, Mahanama, is free from hell, the animal realm, and the domain of ghosts, free from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld. Stop here for a moment. So here you see the description of the Sakadagamin, the second fruition Arya. He does not possess joyous wisdom or swift wisdom. Why? Because the Sakadagamin does not have perfect samadhi. Perfect samadhi in the Buddha's teachings refers to the four jhanas. Uh, when a person possesses four jhanas, uh, his wisdom uh, is deep, uh, is of joyous wisdom, swift wisdom. So you see the Anagamin and the Arahan, uh, they have joyous wisdom and swift wisdom. Joyous, wis joyous wisdom and swift wisdom, I think is Hasapanya and Javanapanya. The Sakadagamin, uh, he may have uh, one jhana, two jhanas, three jhanas, uh, but because he does not possess four jhanas, huh? he does not have joyous wisdom or swift wisdom. That's the difference. Huh? And the Buddha continues. Here Mahanama, some person possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. He is not one of joyous wisdom nor of swift wisdom and he has not attained liberation. With the utter destruction of three factors, he is a stream enterer, Sotapanna, no longer bound to the netherworld, fixed in destiny with enlightenment as his destination. This person too, Mahanama, is freed from hell, the animal realm, and the domain of ghosts, freed from the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the netherworld. Here, Mahanama, some person does not possess firm confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. He is not one of joyous wisdom, nor of swift wisdom, and he has not attained liberation. However, he has these five things, the faculty of faith, energy, recollection, concentration, and wisdom. And the teachings proclaimed by the Tathagata are accepted by him after being pondered to a sufficient degree with wisdom. This person too, Mahanama, is one who does not go to hell, the animal realm or the domain of ghosts, to the plane of misery, the bad destination, the netherworld. Here, Mahanama, some person does not possess confirmed confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. He is not one of joyous wisdom nor of swift wisdom, and he has not attained liberation. However, he has these five things, the faculty of faith, energy, recollection, concentration, and wisdom. And he has sufficient faith in the Tathagata, sufficient devotion to him. This person too, Mahanama, is one who does not go to hell, the animal realm or the domain of ghosts, 
to the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the nether world. Stop here for a moment. Now, these last two, uh, they are also Arya. Uh, they are called Dhamma Nusari and Sadda Nusari. And they refer uh, to the first path attainer. The first path attainer, uh, you see here, he does not possess uh, unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. He is new to the Dhamma. Uh, he has just learned the Dhamma, has understood the Dhamma to a sufficient degree. Uh, so because of that, uh, the first one, uh, because he is uh, compared to the second one, uh, the first one, uh, the emphasis is more on understanding of the Dhamma. Uh, the second one, uh, he, has some, he also has some understanding of the Dhamma. Um, and his faith is stronger, uh, that's why he's called the Sadda Nusari. You see, for a person to become an Arya, he must have right view. So these two persons uh, must have, have right view. Uh, that means they have heard the Dhamma and understood the basic teachings about the Four Noble Truths. Uh, that's why they have become Arya. Uh, and they, bo- they won't go, they won't be reborn into the woeful plains of rebirth. Uh, however, uh, they do not have unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha yet. Uh, but it doesn't matter because uh, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, in the same lifetime, uh, this person uh, must become a sotapanna. Uh, it's only a matter of time. Uh, uh, it's not like the Abh- Abhidharma says, uh, immediately uh, he will become a sotapanna. Uh, no. It takes some time uh, for him to uh, understand deeper uh, the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and then he, uh, he becomes, uh, he, he has uh, unshakable faith in the Buddha and Dhamma and Sangha. When he has unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and becomes a Sotapanna, the three factors uh, are eliminated. Uh, at the stage of the first path of Jaina, uh, they have not eliminated any factor yet. Uh, just, they just have the understanding, they just have attained the right view. Uh, so they have just come into the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, take some time uh, to to deepen the understanding uh, and then uh, become a Sotapanna. And then lastly, the Buddha said, uh, even if these great Sala trees, Mahanama, could understand what is well spoken and what is badly spoken, then I would declare these great Sala trees to be stream enterers, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny, with enlightenment as their destination. How much more than Sarakani the Sakyan? Mahanama, Sarakani the Sakyan undertook the training at the time of his death, as the end of the Sutta. So here this last part is very important. The Buddha says, uh, even the trees, uh, if they can differentiate between what is well spoken and what is badly spoken, uh, and if they heard the Dhamma, the Buddha's teachings, uh, even trees also can become Sotapanna. How can a human not become a Sotapanna from listening to the Dhamma? So, what is important here uh, is that, what is implied here is that to become a Sotapanna, you have to listen to the Dhamma. It is not from meditation. Uh, if it is Sotapanna is to be attained by meditation, uh, the Buddha would have said, uh, but if I taught these trees to meditate, uh, even they can become Sotapanna. But the Buddha did not say that. The Buddha said, uh, if they can understand, in other words, they can understand the Dhamma. Uh, this is a very important point. A lot of people, uh, because they don't study the suttas, uh, they think uh, that uh, becoming a suttapanna is by meditation, but actually it is by listening to the Dhamma. Mm. The other thing is, uh, the Buddha says, uh, if a person has uh, taken refuge for a long time uh, with the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, he cannot be be born in the woeful plains of destination. Uh, what is meant here is that he has learned the Dhamma, la, has gone for refuge over a long time, la, has learned the Dhamma for a long time. La. Yes, uh, if he has learned the Dhamma for a long time, if he has associ- associated uh, with Aryans, uh, then he would have learned the Aryan Dhamma. And after learning the Aryan Dhamma, he would have put it into practice. La, and so it's natural. La that uh, he will go for a good rebirth. Uh, so, the most important point of this sutta is that Sotapanna is attained uh, by listening to the Dhamma and understanding. Uh, 
not just by meditation. But meditation can help na. Because if we meditate na, we focus the mind na. And if the mind is focused, then when we listen to the Dhamma, it's easier, it's easier to understand. Okay, the next sutta is 55.26. That's Savati. Now on that occasion, the householder, Anatta Pindika, was sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Then the householder, Anatta Pindika, addressed the man thus, Come, good man, approach the venerable Sariputta, pay homage to him in my name with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable sir, the householder, Anatta Pindika, is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. He pays homage to the venerable Sariputta with his head at his feet. Then say, it would be good, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder, Nata Pindika, out of compassion. Stop here for a moment. This Anatta Pindika, his name uh, is a nickname uh, because he provides uh, for orphans. Uh, he looks after orphans. Uh, that's why he's called Anatta Pindika. Uh, but his actual name, I think, is Sudatta. Uh, and he's a, he's a great fan of Venerable Sariputta. La. Of all the monks, eh, he appreciates the Venerable Sariputta the most. La. That's why when he is dying, he asks his uh, workers to go and summon Venerable Sariputta. La. Yes, Master, the man replied. And he approached the Venerable Sariputta, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and delivered his message. The Venerable Sariputta consented by silence. Then in the morning, the Venerable Sariputta dressed and taking bowl and robe, went to the residence of the householder Anatta Pindika with the Venerable Ananda as his companion. He then sat down in the appointed seat and said to the householder Anatta Pindika, I hope you are bearing up, householder. I hope you are getting better. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that their subsiding, not their increase, is to be discerned. And Anatta Pindika said, I am not bearing up, Venerable Sir. I am not getting better. Strong, painful feelings are increasing in me, not subsiding. And their increase, not their subsiding, is to be discerned. And Venerable Sariputta said, You, householder, do not have that distrust towards the Buddha, which the uninstructed worldling possesses, because of which the latter, with the breakup of the body after death, is reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the nether world, in hell. You have confirmed confidence in the Buddha. Thus the Blessed One is a teacher of devas and humans, etc. As you consider within yourself that confirmed confidence in the Buddha, your pains may subside on the spot. You, householder, do not have that distrust towards the Dhamma which the uninstructed worldling possesses, because of which the latter is reborn the plane of misery in hell. You have confirmed confidence in the Dhamma thus. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, to be personally experienced by the wise. As you consider within yourself that confirmed confidence in the Dhamma, your pains may subside on the spot. You, householder, do not have that distrust towards the Sangha, which the uninstructed worldling possesses, because of which the latter is reborn in the plane of misery in hell. You have confirmed confidence in the Sangha thus. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way, uh, the straight way, etc. As you consider within yourself that confirmed confidence in the Sangha, your pains may subside on the spot. You, householder, do not, that, do not have that immorality which the uninstructed worldly possesses, because of which the latter is reborn in the plane of misery in hell. You have those virtues dear to the noble ones unbroken, leading to concentration. As you consider within yourself those virtues dear to the noble ones, your pains may subside on the spot. You, householder, do not have that wrong view which the uninstructed worldling possesses, because of which the latter is reborn in the plane of misery in hell. You have right view. As you consider within yourself that right view, your pains may subside on the spot. You, householder, do not have wrong intention, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong recollection, wrong concentration, wrong knowledge, wrong liberation, which the uninstructed whirling possesses, because of which the latter is reborn in the pain of misery in hell. You have right 
right intention or right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right recollection, right concentration, right knowledge, right liberation. As you consider within yourself that right liberation, your pains may subside on the spot. Then the pains of the householder, Anatta Pindika, subsided on the spot. Then the householder, Anatta Pindika, served the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Ananda from his own dish. When the Venerable Sariputta had finished his meal and had put away his bowl, the householder, Anatta Pindika, took a low seat and sat down to one side. And the Venerable Sariputta thanked him with these verses. When one has faith in the Tathagata, unshakable and well established, and good conduct built on virtue, dear to the noble ones and praised, when one has confidence in the Sangha and view that has been rectified, they say that one is not poor, that one's life is not in vain. Therefore, the person of intelligence, remembering the Buddha's teachings, should be devoted to faith and virtue, to confidence and vision of the Dhamma. Then the Venerable Sariputta, having thanked the, the householder Anatta Pindika with these verses, rose from his seat and departed. Then the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. The Blessed One then said to him, Now, Ananda, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? And he said, The householder Anatta Pindika, Venerable Sir, has been exhorted by the Venerable Sariputta with such and such an exhortation. And Buddha said, Sariputta is wise, Ananda. Sariputta has great wisdom in so far as he can analyze the four factors of stream entry in ten modes. That's the end of the sutta. So here, the Venerable Sariputta, he came to see this uh, Anatta Pindika, and Anatta Pindika thought that he was going to die. Nah. Then the Venerable Sar Sariputta re reminded him nah, that he has these uh, factors of stream entry, nah, unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and uh, Aryan Sila, nah, oral conduct. And then also reminded him uh, that he has these eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, plus uh, right knowledge and right liberation. Now this is right knowledge and right liberation uh, is normally uh, only used for the Arahan, and Anatta Pindika is not an Arahan, but uh, there is uh, two or three suttas uh, there. Uh, this right knowledge and right liberation uh, is mentioned uh, even for the Sotapanna. So what is meant uh, is that uh, it is not right knowledge, is not perfect knowledge. La. It is partial knowledge. La. And right liberation is not full liberation, uh, it is also partial liberation. Uh, because once a person has become a Sotapanna, he definitely will attain liberation, la. a maximum of seven more lifetimes. Uh, so he's already on the path to liberation. There's no stopping him uh, from becoming liberated. Uh, only thing is a matter of time. Uh, so in that sense, uh, he's, uh, he has attained partial liberation. Uh, so you see, this uh, Venerable Sariputta is very skillful. Uh, mentioned these uh, things uh, to remind uh, Remember, to remind this Anatta Pindika that he is already an Arya. So he, will be, he became so happy uh, that all his uh, sickness disappeared. So a lot of sickness uh, has to do with our mind. If we are very happy, uh, we forgot about our sickness already. The next sutta is 55.30. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Vesali in the great wood in the hall with the peak roof. Then Nandaka, the minister of the Lichavis, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. The Blessed One then said to him, Nandaka, a noble disciple who possesses four things is a stream enterer, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny, with enlightenment as his destination. What for? Here Nandaka, a noble disciple possesses firm confidence in the Buddha, he possesses confirmed confidence in the Dhamma. He possesses confirmed confidence in the Sangha. He possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, unblemished, leading to concentration. A noble disciple who possesses these four things is a stream enterer, Sotapanna, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny, 
with enlightenment as his destination. Further, Nandaka, a noble disciple who possesses these four things, becomes endowed with long lifespan, whether celestial or human. He becomes endowed with beauty, whether celestial or human. He becomes endowed with happiness, whether celestial or human. He becomes endowed with fame, whether celestial or human. He becomes endowed with sovereignty, whether celestial or human. Now I say this Nandaka without having heard it from another ascetic or Brahmin. Rather, I say just what I have known, seen and understood by myself. When this was said, a man said to Nandaka, the minister of the Lichavis, It is time for your bath, sir. And he said, Enough now, I say, with that external bath. This internal bath will suffice, namely confidence in the Blessed One. That's the end of the Sutta. Uh, in the last part, nah, the man told him, time to take your bath. He said, no need for the outside bath. Nah. My inside already taken the bath. <laughs> this uh, last part of the Buddha's teaching uh, is quite interesting. An Aryan disciple nah, possesses four things, you know. These four things in Pali is called Ayu, Vano, Sukang, Balang. Uh, sometimes when we do chanting, uh, uh, the monks do chanting, uh, they chant this Ayu, Vano, Sukang, Sukang, Balang. Ayu is long life. Mm. Second one is uh, Ayu, Vano. Vano is beauty. Sukang is happiness. Balang is strength or power. La. So here it refers to fame and sovereignty. La. So, if we become uh, Sotapanna in this lifetime, uh, next time if we are reborn as a human being or in heaven, uh, we will possess these four things. Uh, that's why uh, it is so good uh, to become an Arya. Uh, there's nothing better than becoming an Arya, at least a Sotapanna. Uh, once you become a Sotapanna, then you can slowly uh, get out of Sangsara. You don't have to finish <laughs> uh, uh, in one lifetime. Uh. Since there's a maximum of seven more lifetimes, and I slowly la, enjoy la, every lifetime you come back. I sure enjoy one because you have these four things. Mm, Ayubano Sukang Balang. The next sutta is 55.36. Buddha said, Monks, when a noble disciple possesses four things, the devas are elated and speak of his similarity to themselves. What for? Here, monks, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha. Uh, thus, the Blessed One is a teacher of devas and humans, the enlightened one, the Blessed One, etc. To those devatas who passed away from here in the human world and were reborn there in the heavenly world, possessing confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the thought occurs. As the noble disciple possesses the same confirmed confidence in the Buddha that we possess when we passed away there and were reborn here, he will come into the presence of the devas. Again, monks, a noble po disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Dhamma, confirmed confidence in the Sangha, and he possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, unblemished, conducive to concentration. To those devatas who passed away from here and were reborn in the heavenly world, possessing the, vir the virtue of the noble ones, the thought occurs that uh, this noble disciple uh, will come into the presence of the devas. When monks, a noble disciple possesses these four things, the devas are elated and speak of his similarity to themselves. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. Mm. It's quite interesting. Uh, what the Buddha is saying uh, is that uh, if we have these four factors of stream entry, uh, the devas uh, will be very happy with us. Uh. They know uh, that one day uh, we will join them in the heaven. Uh, so they are waiting for us uh, to, uh, to be a uh, member there. Uh, uh. So if that is the case, uh, once you become an Arya, then they keep an eye on you. Uh, must keep an eye on our member. <laughs> anyway, if you have the, 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 the virtues of an Arya, your good karma itself uh, is a great protection. Uh. 55.37 On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans at Kapilavatu in Igrodas Park. Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Venerable Sir, in what way is one a lay follower? And the Buddha said, 
When Mahanama, one has gone for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha, one is then a lay follower. In what way, Venerable Sir, is a lay follower accomplished in virtue? When Mahanama, a lay follower, abstains from the disruption of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, and from wines, liquor, and intoxicants that are a basis for negligence, the lay follower is accomplished in virtue. In what way, Venerable Sir, is a lay follower accomplished in faith? Here, Mahanama, a lay follower is a person of faith. He places faith in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. In that way, a lay follower is accomplished in faith. In what way, Venerable Sir, is a lay follower accomplished in generosity? Here, Mahanama, a lay follower dwells at home with a mind devoid of the stain of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, one devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. In that way, a lay follower is accomplished in generosity. In what way, Venerable Sir, is a lay follower accomplished in wisdom? Here, Mahanama, a lay follower is wise. He possesses wisdom directed to arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative, leading to the complete destruction of suffering. In that way, a lay follower is accomplished in wisdom. That's the end of the sutta. So this is also a very important sutta. Here, the first one, uh, the Buddha defines uh, a Buddhist, uh, a lay follower is a Buddhist. Uh, a Buddhist uh, is defined as a person who takes refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Uh, only the three, three refuges, uh, uh, now, but nowadays people talk about four refuges, uh, uh, but actually it's only three. Uh, uh, they have added uh, the refuge with the teacher, uh, then it's the monk uh, or something. Uh. But actually, uh, we take refuge only the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And you don't necessarily have to go to a monk to take refuge. You can take refuge yourself. And uh, taking refuge uh, means uh, you have trust uh, in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Hmm? You uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, the teachings of the Buddha, the best uh, in the world, uh, and the Buddha has taught uh, uh, what is true, what is reality. Uh, and the Sangha is the disciples of the Buddha who carry on his message, uh, prolong the sasana and teach the Dhamma to the world. Mm. And then a Buddhist uh, has uh, moral conduct, uh, virtue, uh, when he keeps the five precepts, uh, not to kill, not to take what is not given, uh, to refrain from sexual misconduct, from false speech and from intoxicants. Uh. And then uh, a lay follower has faith uh, when he has faith uh, in the enlightenment of the Tathagata, that the, the Buddha is an enlightened being. Uh, there are very few enlightened beings in the world. Uh, and then uh, a lay follower or a Buddhist uh, is generous uh, if he is not stingy, uh, he or she is not stingy, uh, freely generous, uh, open-handed. Uh, devoted to charity uh, and a uh, lay follower or a Buddhist uh, is wise uh, when he can see uh, rising and passing away. Rising is and passing away uh, to refers uh, to impermanence. Uh, everything in the world uh, arises due to conditions and passes away due, due to conditions. Uh. So this is very important. Uh, we have to see uh, impermanence in everything. Uh. When you see impermanence in everything, uh, then uh, there is some vega, there is a sense of urgency uh, to practice, uh, knowing uh, that your life uh, very soon will come to an end. A lot of people think, uh, wait until I'm old, uh, wait a few more years. Uh. <laughs> and a few more years comes, uh, you find uh, yeah, your body uh, is too weak uh, to practice. Uh, I became a monk at the age of 35. I never regretted. The only regret I have... Uh, is uh, a little bit, uh, is that uh, if I could have renounced earlier, it would have been better. Uh. You know why? Because uh, after the age of 45, uh, you want to be a forest monk or so, quite impossible. Uh, because at the age of 45, uh, I found uh, all my body heat uh, slowly going off. Before the age of 45, uh, when I lived in uh, caves, uh, the wind can be very strong. I sit in meditation. The wind very strong also, no problem because my body was like a
like five years, emitting a lot of heat. But at the age of 45, the wind started to go into my bones. <laughs> Could feel it going into my bones, and I cannot cannot stand the, the direct direct wind blowing on me. Uh, if that is the case, uh, then you cannot be a forest monk. Why? Because forest monks they have to sleep in the forest on the ground, and sometimes you sleep on the ground. Uh, you just put a plastic sheet. Uh, there's no uh, uh, there's no uh, mattress for you. No tea lump for you. Uh, so you just sleep on the uh, bare floor. Huh? It can be very cold. Uh, especially you go to forest areas uh, or you sleep in a cave. Uh, uh. So after 45, uh, uh, that type of life uh, is difficult already. Uh. So if some people still want to wait. Uh, it's no time already. <laughs> 55.40 On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans at Kapilavatu in the Grodas Park. Then Nandia, the Sakyan, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said, Noble Sir, when the four factors of stream entry are completely and totally non-existent in a noble disciple, would that noble disciple be one who dwells negligently? And the Buddha said, Nandia, I say that one in whom the four factors of stream entry are completely and totally absent is an outsider, one who stands in the faction of worldlings. But Nandia, as to how a noble disciple is one who dwells negligently and one who dwells diligently, listen to that and attend closely, I will speak. Yes, Venerable Sir, Nandia, the Sakyan replied. The Blessed One said, And how Nandia is a noble disciple, one who dwells negligently. Here, Nandia, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha. Content with that confirmed confidence in the Buddha, he does not make further effort for solitude by day, nor for seclusion at night. When he thus dwells negligently, there is no gladness. When there is no gladness, there is no rap, there is no delight, pity. When there is no delight, there is no tranquility. When there is no tranquility, he dwells in suffering. The mind of one who suffers does not become concentrated. When the mind is not concentrated, phenomena or dhamma do not become manifest. Because dhamma do not become manifest, he is reckoned as one who dwells negligently. Again, Nandia, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the dhamma. He possesses confirmed confidence in the Sangha. He possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, unblemished, leading to concentration. Content with those virtues dear to the noble ones, he does not make further effort for solitude by day, nor for seclusion at night. When he thus dwells negligently, there is no gladness. Uh, there is no, when there is no gladness, there is no delight. When there is no delight, there is no tranquility etc. Uh, and phenomena or dhamma do not become manifest. He is reckoned as one who dwells negligently. It is in this way, Nandia, that a noble disciple is one who dwells negligently. And how Nandia is a noble disciple, one who dwells diligently. Here, Nandia, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha. He makes further effort uh, not content with that confirmed confidence in the Buddha, he makes further effort for solitude by day and for seclusion at night. When he thus dwells diligently, gladness is born. When he is gladdened, uh, delight is born. When the mind is uplifted by delight, the body becomes tranquil. One tranquil in body experiences happiness. The mind of one who is happy becomes concentrated. When the mind is concentrated, Phenomena or Dhamma become manifest. Because phenomena become manifest, become manifest means becomes clear, can be seen clearly. He is reckoned as one who dwells diligently. Again, Nandia, a noble disciple, possesses confirmed confidence in the Dhamma, confirmed confidence in the Sangha, and he possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones. Not content with these, uh, he makes further effort for solitude by day and for seclusion at night. When he thus dwells diligently, gladness is born. And from gladness, uh, delight, tranquility, etc. 
and then phenomena become manifest. He is reckoned as one who dwells diligently. It is in this way in Andhya that a noble disciple is one who dwells diligently. That's the end of the Sutta. So here this uh, layman, uh, Nandia, he asked, Nandia asked the, 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 the Buddha about a noble disciple uh, who does not possess the factors of stream entry. Uh. But then uh, if a person does not possess the factors of stream entry, he cannot be a noble disciple. He's, 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 he's an ordinary disciple, uh, a putujana disciple. That's why the Buddha said, uh, if he does not possess the four factors of stream entry, uh, he is considered an outsider. He stands uh, with the ordinary uh, worldlings. Because uh, you, another way you can call him an outsider uh, is that because his faith is not unshakable. Uh, today he calls himself a Buddhist. Uh, another day uh, he can change his religion. Uh, so he is not uh, really a Buddhist yet. He uh, you know, is only a Buddhist uh, when he enters the Noble Eightfold Path. And a person enters a Noble Eightfold Path uh, by right view. Uh, you must possess right view uh, to enter the Noble Eightfold Path. And when you possess right view, uh, uh, you have entered the stream. Uh, you attain stream entry, you become an Arya. Uh, so if a person does not uh, learn enough Dhamma, does not listen enough uh, to the Buddha's uh, original discourses, uh, his faith uh, is not unshakable faith. Uh. Any time I can change his faith. Uh, so that's why he's considered an outsider. Then the Buddha talked about the noble disciple. Firstly, the noble disciple possesses these four factors of stream entry. He has unshakable faith in the Buddha, unshakable faith in the Dhamma, unshakable faith in the Sangha, and he possesses Aryan moral conduct. Now, after attaining these four factors of stream entry, he's become a, a Sotapanna. Then, uh, if he does not make further effort uh, for solitude by day and for seclusion at night. Solitude by day means uh, he uh, goes into seclusion, you know, he does not mix with people. Hmm? Uh, once a person has understood the Dhamma, he knows uh, that there is nothing more important uh, than practicing the, noble, the, the, the holy path. Uh, then he does not associate with people. Uh, uh, if uh, somebody uh, is a Buddhist, uh, still wants to go holiday here, holiday there, go to China, go overseas and all that, uh, he cannot be uh, from here. Uh, he's not uh, uh, a Sotapanna who dwells uh, diligently. Uh, he's a negligent uh, stream enterer. Uh, and if he's negligent, uh, then he cannot progress. Uh, there's no gladness and there's no delight, etc. And the mind cannot become concentrated uh, so that he cannot see things clearly as they really are. Uh. But a uh, noble disciple uh, is uh, diligent uh, if he makes further effort uh, for seclusion, uh, becomes aloof from others, doesn't want to mix with society uh, and uh, practices, uh, spends most of his time uh, studying the Dhamma and meditating. Uh, and then he make, can make progress uh, because uh, when he makes effort, uh, then the mind becomes focused uh, if he meditates. Uh, and when the mind is focused, uh, it is not scattered, uh, then gladness arises, uh, followed by delight, tranquility, concentration. Uh, then when he, a person attains concentration, it means he has attained the jhanas. Uh, when a person, person attains the jhanas, uh, the five hindrances fall away uh, so that he can see things as they really are. Yatta Bhutta Jnana Dasana. Uh, and that's very important. Because only when you can see things as they really are, that there is a chance for liberation. Uh, this is about a noble disciple, and whether he's diligent or not diligent. Uh, okay. Next Sutta is 55.53. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana. That the lay follower, Dhammadina, together with 500 lay followers, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. Sitting to one side, the lay follower, Dhammadina, then said to the Blessed One, Let the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, exhort us and instruct us in a way that may lead to our wealth and happiness for a long time. 
And the Buddha said, Therefore, Dhammadina, you should train yourselves thus. From time to time, we will enter and dwell upon those discourses spoken by the Tathagata that are deep, deep in meaning, supramundane. Uh, that means uh, transcending the world, dealing with emptiness. It is in such a way that you should train yourselves. And they say, Remember, sir, it is not easy for us dwelling in a home crowded with children, enjoying classy sandalwood, wearing garlands, scents and unguents, receiving gold and silver, that is money, eh? from time to time to enter and dwell upon those discourses spoken by the Tathagata that are deep, deep in meaning, super mundane, dealing with emptiness. As we are established in the five training rules, let the Blessed One teach us the Dhamma further. And the Buddha said, Therefore, Dhammadina, you should train yourselves thus. We will possess confirmed confidence in the Buddha, confirm confidence in the Dhamma, confirm confidence in the Sangha. We will possess the virtues <clears throat> dear to the noble ones, unbroken and blemished, leading to concentration. This in such a way that you should train yourselves. And they said, Remember, sir, as to those four factors of stream entry taught by the Blessed One, these things exist in us, and we live in conformity with those things. For Venerable Sir, we possess confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha, and we possess the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, unblemished, leading to concentration. And the Buddha said, It is a gain for you, Dhammadina. It is well gained by you, Dhammadina. You have declared the fruit of stream entry. That's the end of the Sutta. So here, you can see uh, that uh, when lay people come to the Buddha for advice, uh, the Buddha asks them uh, to study uh, the discourses uh, of the Buddha, the suttas. Uh, uh, for lay people, uh, it's quite difficult to practice meditation. So lay people uh, should concentrate uh, on studying the suttas and understanding the suttas. When you understand the suttas, uh, then you will attain right view. And once you attain right view, uh, you will naturally uh, come to have uh, unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha uh, and you will naturally keep the Aryan Sila uh, consisting of the seven precepts. Uh. Uh, if you have these uh, four factors of stream entry, uh, then it is, the Buddha says, uh, it is a gain for you, it is well gained by you. Uh, and you have declared the fruit of stream entry. Uh. So you'll never be reborn in the woeful planes of existence. So I'll stop here. We can discuss anything. Noble disciple uh, means an Aryan disciple. An Aryan disciple can be a lay person or a monk. That is still necessary if you want to progress eh, from Sotapanna to Sakadagamin and Anagamin and Arahan. A lot of lay people, eh, because they cannot let go, so they cannot progress. Eh. The most they can attain eh, is stream entry. Eh. But there are some eh, during the Buddha's time, eh, like Chitta, Hataka and all that, eh, they go into seclusion. Eh, their, their, their room, eh, their house, eh, the room becomes like a cave to them. Eh. They don't get, get out of their room. Uh, they practice day and night in their room until they attain uh, the four jhanas and all that. You see, in the, uh, just now I mentioned, uh, in the Buddha's teachings, uh, a person is really dead uh, when three things leave him, uh, right? The vitality, consciousness, and body heat. Uh, uh. So I would uh, suggest uh, that if any person wants to donate his organs, uh, that he should he can stipulate uh, this condition uh, that only when the body becomes cold uh, that they can uh, take away the organs, uh, because uh, people have downloaded uh, for me uh, from the internet. Uh, um, sometimes uh, it seems uh, that some people uh, even declared to be brainstem dead. Uh. Uh, you know, some people get into accident uh, 
and their brain is damaged uh, and they have no chance of recovering uh, because the brain is damaged. So the brain stem, once the brain stem is dead, uh, the doctor says uh, this person is dead uh, and they start uh, taking the organs. But it seems there's some evidence uh, that when they do that, uh, certain people, uh, they, uh, that body uh, becomes frightened uh, in the sense that the heart beat, the heart pumps faster, blood pressure goes up and all that. Uh, so. Wait a minute, eh? there's a difference between clinically dead eh? and brainstem dead. Because I said eh? clinically dead eh? means the heart has stopped beating and the breath has stopped. Eh? But there have been cases eh, of people eh, even clinically dead, eh, declared clinically dead. Eh? After one or two days, eh, they revive. They come to life again. So they have not died. The, the doctor thought they have died. So in the um, in the case of uh, clinical death, uh, if the body is still warm, uh, usually he's not dead yet. Uh, and if you start taking the organs and all that, uh, it will not be good for him. <laughs> So as I mentioned just now, uh, if you have already signed the form, then you can add a condition uh, that uh, only when the body becomes cold, uh, the, the doctor can take it. Certain countries like Singapore, uh, they don't need you to sign. Uh, they assume that you have already donated. Oh, the parents still have to consent. Uh. Oh. Oh, I thought there's a certain law that uh, they assume uh, that you have, uh, no. Right. Malaysia definitely, because it's uh, uh, Muslims and Christians, uh, they don't like to have the body cut up. I mean, if the family can afford to hire me to do after, that would be ideal. So if you can, like once in a while, just go and uh, pay a visit, na, at least uh, show that you uh, you you uh, know the 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 burden also, la. They like to share a bit of that burden, na. and once in a while, la, it's good, na. It's like moral giving them moral support, na. But if you don't go at all, uh, you know, some, some people, they, they, they feel very annoyed. You, know. you have to compromise a bit, uh, I guess. But uh, like in her case, uh, I know uh, that uh, she has some other sisters uh, what, looking after her. Uh, and uh, they don't really need her. Uh, but once in a while, uh, at least she show her presence uh, to make them uh, happy. Uh. And, uh, but uh, like today, when I asked her to stay longer, uh, she said that the uh, the family, you know, if she doesn't, if she comes too long, uh, the family uh, may not be happy, uh. So it's not just that that that, that relative who's sick, you know, it's that the, her own family itself. Uh, uh, she feels that uh, if she comes too long, uh, they feel like she's neglecting her duty, uh. So it's a matter of compromise. Lah, you know? We do what we can. No, at stream entry. Stream entry. Good rebirth, you don't have to, to, to learn the Dhamma. If you are a good Christian or so, you can go to heaven. It, it's about stream entry to become a Sotapanna. You must hear the Dhamma and understand the Dhamma. That's why the Buddha said, nah, even the Tsala trees, nah, if they can understand what is if they can differentiate nah, between what is uh, wholesome and unwholesome, that means if they hear the Dhamma, even the trees also can become Sotapanna. In other words, nah, stream entry, becoming a Sotapanna, is by listening to the Dhamma and not meditation. Yeah. Uh, 
If you study those uh, Mahayana Sutras uh, as I have studied uh, for nine years, uh, and you will know uh, that uh, there are contradictions uh, with the Theravada Suttas. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, if you study the Suttas, uh, you find uh, among Mahayana Sutras themselves there are contradictions. Uh, uh, and then the third thing uh, is that the Buddha gave a warning, in, I think in this Sangita Nikaya, I think it's 20.7, the Buddha said in the future, uh, uh, people would not listen to his words, uh, the discourses of the Buddha dealing with emptiness, uh, dealing with not-self, dealing with suffering and all that. Instead, people want to study the words of later disciples. Uh, so. When the Buddha talks about the words of later disciples, that refers to Mahayana Sutras, lah, because Mahayana Sutras appeared 500 years after the Buddha's passing away. It started by, by people like Nagarjuna, Asvagosa, Vasubandhu, etc. And in the biography of Nagarjuna, what the Chinese call Long Supusa, he was asked, lah, how is it nah, that previously there were no such sutras? Now you say uh, that these are the words of the Buddha, discourses of the Buddha. Then he said he went to the dragon palace under the ocean and took out all these sutras. That we cannot accept because firstly the Buddha says uh, that he does not have the closed fists of a teacher. He does not hide certain teachings. Uh, and also the Buddha said very clearly uh, that the true Dhamma is for all to see. Uh. Only deviant teachings uh, are secretive. If any teachings are secretive, uh, there must be something wrong with it. Uh, that's why they want to be secretive. Uh. Yeah. So, the Buddha, uh, that is, uh, that's one thing. The other thing uh, is that during the Buddha's time, there were no books. So how could the Buddha have hidden the books in the Dragon Palace? There were no books during the Buddha's time. Books only appeared uh, 500 years after the Buddha's passing away. Right? Uh, thirdly, uh, if you look, at the Mahayana Sutras, uh, at the back of the Sutras, uh, they always encourage people uh, to rewrite those Sutras and distribute. Now, during the Buddha's time, nobody could have uh, asked anybody uh, to write the Sutras and distribute because there were no books right, during the Buddha's time. So we know definitely all these writings appeared years later. Uh, and another thing uh, you find in Mahayana Sutras, uh, it is characteristic of Mahayana Sutras uh, to always talk about Mahayana and Hinayana, big vehicle and a small vehicle. And that shows uh, the Sangha had already split. Uh, uh, but during the Buddha's time, the Sangha was one Sangha. There was no split Sangha, no Mahayana and Hinayana. So these uh, Mahayana Sutras uh, must have occurred uh, hundreds of years after the Buddha's passing away then, uh, when the Sangha was really split into different sects. Uh. Uh, the other thing is not only uh, later teachings, it's not only uh, Mahayana Sutras, but even in Theravada sect himself, uh, you have commentaries, yeah, those are later teachings. You have Abhidhamma, you have Isudhi Maga, all those are later teachings. Of course, there are certain good things inside there, lah, but unfortunately, it is mixed with Adhamma, things that are contradictory to what the Buddha said. Lah. So because of that, lah, you have to be very careful. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So in other words, uh, they think they are Buddhists, uh, they are not Buddhists. The Buddha says uh, they are outsiders, they are not Buddhists. Which reminds me uh, that in certain suttas, uh, when the Buddha uh, taught to some external sect ascetics, uh, of course, they argue with the Buddha, lah, and after argument and all that, lah, the Buddha showed them the true Dhamma, then they become converted. You know what they say? They say, oh, they are so fortunate lah, to, to hear the Buddha's words, lah, and then they say, um, they thought that they were monks, but they were not monks. They thought they were following the true Dhamma, they were not following the true Dhamma. Unless lah, you have the good karma lah, to come into the true Dhamma, you can be misled lah, for many years. Lah. Uh, 
Uh, just like the Chitta Sangyutta, we read about the external sex ascetic, the naked ascetic by the name of Kasapa. He spent 30 years uh, suffering uh, as a naked ascetic uh, and he gained nothing. And then when he met Chitta, then he was shocked to find that uh, Chitta is a lay person uh, following the Buddha and has become an anagamin, has attained the four jhanas and will be reborn in the four jhana heaven. Uh, then he realized that he wasted all his time and then he became a Buddhist monk. Uh, so a lot of people, uh, because of not understanding the original teachings of the Buddha, uh, we spend a lot of effort. Uh, like I did, uh, I spent nine years in Mahayana Buddhism. The end of it, uh, then uh, I got disappointed. So it's, it's very difficult to change uh, such people's uh, mindset uh, because they have not investigated the original sutta. If they took the trouble to investigate, uh, then only uh, they may realize. Uh, it's just like people follow other religions. Uh, uh, they, they don't understand the Buddha's teachings, so they belittle the Buddha's teachings. Uh, but if only they took the effort uh, to understand, uh, then they may appreciate uh. Which one? Which one? Yeah, yeah. Once uh, a person uh, uh, possesses, the, that the Sutta says, uh, the noble disciple uh, will possess these four qualities. Uh, that means once you become a noble disciple, uh, you will attain these things uh, uh, even in this lifetime. Uh, the only thing it takes time. Uh, it takes time. Just because, um, like you donate, uh, you have a good intention, uh, but uh, because you are doing something uh, that is not really beneficial, uh, so uh, the uh, merit from there uh, is very, very small, uh, even though you have a good intention, uh, very small. Mm. It's like some people, they think uh, it is meritorious uh, to bow to the Buddha statue. If there's any merit, uh, it's negligible, uh, so small. Mm. Or it's uh, meritorious uh, to offer rice to the Buddha, uh, or to chant repentance and all this. Uh. You have good intention, but the merit uh, is so small. If you support our Dhamma, but your intention is good, na, there is some merit. Na. However, if you believe in that wrong Dhamma, ah, that is bad karma. Having that wrong view, ah, believe in that wrong teaching, ah, that will bring you to a bad rebirth. We find in the Sutta, there's one Sutta, I think earlier we read about the Devata Sangyuta, one of those uh, Suttas, ah, that in the heavens ah, you have disciples of external sect, ascetic teachers ah, in heaven also. Even the teacher is teaching wrong, uh, but because they, they did good, uh, they support the teacher and all. The only thing is they didn't understand maybe the teacher's uh, wrong view, uh, so they are reborn in the good heaven. Uh. Then, uh, 
only support you to other uh, to do the direction or to take uh, something good. Ah, if you support some other Buddhist sect, uh, it probably is not the it's not the sangha because uh, if you support them, uh, in future what they teach, uh, is not the Buddha's teaching, right? If you support the the sangha uh, that propagates the right dhamma, that is meritorious. That is very meritorious. But if you support a sangha that teaches something else. It's not the Buddha's teaching, then that is not supporting the Sangha. In the monks Vinaya, it is mentioned, uh, the Buddha said uh, that his disciples uh, can have communion, uh, that means associate, uh, mix uh, with even external sect ascetics uh, if they practice the same Dhamma Vinaya. That means uh, if a Hindu Swami, uh, what he practices uh, is the same as what the Buddha teaches. Uh, we can consider him to be part of the Sangha. It's not that he wears the same robe. It's what he believes in, what he teaches. In the uh, Vinaya, if you go according to Vinaya, they are not considered part of our Sangha. Because uh, the Dhamma and the Vinaya, they practice is different. The suttas or the sutras they follow uh, is different from our Theravada's suttas. And the Vinaya they keep uh, is also different. Not to mention Mahayana or Tibetan monks. Even uh, Theravada monks, uh, if they follow different Dhamma Vinaya, we also cannot mix with them, we cannot consider them as part of the Sangha. For example, if some monk, uh, even though he wears a Theravada robe, uh, he does not keep the precepts. Uh, we don't consider him as part of the Sangha. You know that? Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, the Buddha did not, uh, like other religions, uh, consider the Sangha as all the monks. You know? A Sangha is defined uh, as a group of monks uh, who live within a Sima, within a boundary. Those who live within a certain boundary uh, are considered one Sangha. Once you step out of the sang of the boundary, uh, you are no more part of the Sangha. That's what a lot of people don't realize. So like for example, our monastery, the Sima, the boundary, uh, is the boundary of our land, 15 acres land. Any monk uh, who is outside our boundary uh, is not considered part of our Sangha. Even though they are Theravada monks, even though they keep the same Dhamma Vinaya, only when they come into our boundary, eh, they are considered one Sangha. A lot of things they people don't understand. Mm. So that is one thing. Another thing is if they follow different Dhamma Vinaya, they are not, they are not, they are, they, the Buddha says uh, we must not associate with them, we must not treat them as the same Sangha of monks. So if Mahayana monks, eh, they follow Mahayana Sutras uh, and they don't keep the Vinaya like we keep, uh, then we don't associate with them. However, a monk like maybe Kong Hai Pasa from Taiwan, he teaches, even though he wears the Mahayana robes, uh, but he teaches the Dhamma uh, like our Theravada Dhamma, we can accept him as part of the Sangha, even though he wears different robe. So what is important uh, is whether the Dhamma and the Vinaya he practices uh, is the same as us, according to the Vinaya. Okay, shall we stop here?